Verhaal, oral questions, Lennerhout zegt de oppositie. This prime minister's incompetence is just not worth the cost. With his excessive spending at the federal level, he has caused so many messes in the military, immigration, inflation, the housing market, and so many more. But instead of cleaning up his own mess, he's just creating more problems with expensive promises promises that interfere with provincial jurisdiction. Why is this Liberal Prime Minister bringing his incompetence into areas of Quebec competency? The Honourable Minister of Public Services. Mr. Speaker, it's quite humorous to hear the word incompetence in the mouth of the Leader of the Opposition. When he was Housing Minister, who created only six affordable housing units for the whole country during his term, recently, he accused Quebec municipalities of being incompetent. On March 15th, with Quebec City, we started 324 affordable housing units. Who's really incompetent here? The leader of the opposition with his six units or Quebec municipalities with hundreds? The honorable leader of the opposition. When I was housing minister, housing costs were half of what they are today. And hundreds of thousands of housing units were created with low interest rates. Today, we learned that the Bank of Canada will not be lowering interest rates. And the governor of the Bank of Canada has already said that if governments spend too much, interest rates will remain high, which will send people into bankruptcy. Will this prime minister finally accept my common sense plan? A dollar-for-dollar dollar plan to balance the budget and bring down interest rates. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition was just talking about the government of Quebec, and I talked about Quebec municipalities. Now, with the Quebec government, we signed an agreement to create 8,000 new affordable housing units. During his term as Housing Minister, the Leader of the Opposition created six affordable housing units, and yet he called Quebec municipalities incompetent. When will he agree to come with me to meet with the Quebec City leaders to apologize in person? The opposition. Mr. Speaker, I'll never apologize for keeping housing costs low when I was the Minister of Housing. But if you were hoping for some interest rate relief today as a mortgage holder, as someone with a small business loan or a line of credit, you got some bad news that the Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Rates are staying high long because, as the Governor of the Bank of Canada said, if government spending grows, then interest rates will have to stay high to combat the resulting inflation. Why won't the Prime Minister accept my common sense plan to fix the budget with a dollar for dollar law to bring down rates? The Honourable President of the Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker, it's possible to be prudent fiscally and have strong social programs exactly. as well. That's exactly yes. what our government does with the AAA credit rating, with the lowest debt to GDP ratio in the G7, and with historically low unemployment. At the same time, we have a national school food program on the table of $1 billion. and homeowners. That's what we do on this side of the house. Every day is a great day to fight for Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Every day is not a great day when you're living in a tent city That's or right. when you've had your mortgage double or when, when, you're one of, when you are uh, with the families that one in four children who can't get enough food, and they put forward a food program that doesn't have any food. Right. Instead, what they've done is doubled the national debt and driven up interest rates. Today, we learned that the Bank of Canada is unable to bring rates down because the Prime Minister continues to make massive, multi-billion dollar inflationary spending. Why won't he follow my common sense plan to bring down the deficit and the rates? The Honourable President of the Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker, wages are growing faster than inflation. Under the Conservatives, poverty was at 14.5 per cent. When we replaced the Conservatives, we brought it down to 7.4 per cent. Mr. Speaker, we will 
continue to invest in Canadians with the supports for affordable housing, for renters, for early learning and child care. And because of our work, we will make life fairer for Canadians, unlike the Conservative leader who is here for himself. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, we're finding out today from the Bank of Canada that the Prime Minister is not worth the cost. In September, the bank governor said that if government spending were to grow, then interest rates would have to stay high. That was echoed by the former bank governor and incoming Liberal leader, Mark Carney, who indi indicated that, that he does not expect rates to, qu to fall quickly and that that is partly because of a lack of fiscal discipline. So if he won't listen to me, why won't he listen to his successor and understand that he is not worth the cost of high interest rates? The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I hope the Conservative will listen this time because Canadians are watching at home. Mr. Speaker, we will take no lessons from the Conservative. On this side of the House, we have a plan to build more houses. We have a plan to build more prosperity in this country. We have a plan to create more jobs, Mr. Speaker. On the other side, they have slogan, Mr. Speaker. Canadians are smart. They understand that slogans don't build homes. They understand that slogans don't create jobs. They understand that slogans don't Mr. Speaker, every day is a good day to fight for Canadians. That's what we've got to do. If this goes on, I'm certain that the honorable member for La Prairie will think that it's about him, the honorable member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, for three weeks, the prime minister has been making pre-budget announcements in Quebec jurisdiction, but not today. Today, he is at the foreign interference inquiry, so he doesn't have time for domestic in interference health, schools, housing, dental care, child care. It's the Liberals, not the Bloc, who think they are governing Quebec. Ottawa has the money, but Quebec has the expertise. If Ottawa wants to help Quebec, it should just increase transfers. What is this government waiting for? The Honourable Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. It's always a good time to speak about the impacts that government investments have for Quebecers. Let's start with child care, a $6 billion investment over four years, which will help families and especially women. 35,000 new child care spots, which will, of course, help families, which will reduce poverty, increase gender equality, help children, all while respecting Quebec jurisdiction. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, this is a real budget striptease, one little piece at a time. At the rate it's going, the budget lockdown on April 16th will be no longer than five minutes. There will be nothing left to announce. And what will be left to spend after using billions of dollars to interfere with Quebec's jurisdiction? I know that competence would interfere with this Liberal government's brand. Look at Phoenix, passports, arrive can, asylum seekers. But that's no reason to violate Quebec jurisdiction. Could this government please transfer money instead of interfering? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to answer another question, to give a second example of how we're working well with Quebec on housing this time. $1.8 billion 
in an agreement that was signed a few weeks ago that will enable Quebec to build more affordable housing than ever before, which will greatly benefit Quebecers, especially lower-income Quebecers. The Honourable Member from Burnaby South. Yesterday, the Assembly of First Nations made it clear that this government is letting down Indigenous people. Right now, the Indigenous funding gap in infrastructure has risen to an astronomical $350 billion. That's not just a number on paper. That means Indigenous people are living in moldy homes. That means Indigenous people don't have access to clean drinking water. Why did this Liberal government turn their back on Indigenous people? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, for decades and decades, Canada has underinvested in Indigenous communities, and this government is putting a stop to that. We've increased funding for housing on First Nations by 1,100 percent, Mr. Speaker. And while we know there is a long way to go, I want to thank the AFN for co-writing this report with us. It's a very important to understand the size of the gap so that we can work even more quickly to close it together. Then I have Deputy to Burnaby Sud. It's not just Indigenous people that this government is letting down, it's also Canadians living with disabilities. Right now, Canadians living with disabilities are disproportionately living in poverty. And according to Angus Reid, 90% of Canadians support a Canadian disability benefit. But this Liberal government continues to delay the implementation of this benefit, and the Conservatives voted against it. So why is this government continuing to delay? Enough is enough. When will people get their checks? When will people actually get the benefit? Here, here. The Honourable Minister for Diversity, Inclusion and, and Disability, People with Disabilities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member knows extremely well that Canada Disability Benefit is another concrete step to reduce, reduce poverty and to support Canadians who need it the most, Mr. Speaker. This is our top priority. We're on track to deliver the benefit, Mr. Speaker. In the spirit of nothing without us, I want to take an opportunity to thank the disability community for their relentless advocacy and for the work that they have been doing, Mr. Speaker. We will get it right and we will get it out for Canadians living with disabilities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Dufferin Culloden. Tina from Orangeville just sent me a photo from the Orangeville Food Bank. There's no juice, there's no cereal, and there's almost no diapers. This is because the people who used to donate food are now lined up for food. This is actually Canada after eight years of this corrupt, incompetent NDP Liberal government. That's right. Will the Prime Minister finally show he has even a modicum of compassion for Canadians? Pass Conservative Bill C-234 that will take all carbon taxes off all farmers so Canadians can once again afford food. The Honourable Minister for Thank Natural you, Resources Speaker. and Energy. It is important in this country, and certainly Canadians understand that we address the climate crisis that is uh, facing us. There are significant costs that we are facing, including issues around wildfires as we move forward, if we do not address climate change. But it is also important that we do that in a manner that is affordable. Eight out of ten Canadians get more money back from the carbon rebate than they pay in the, in the price on pollution. If you are going to take it away, as the Leader of the Opposition would do, you are actually attacking the poorest members in our society. Shame on you. I'm going to ask uh, all members, please, to uh, not take the floor until all um, until the person who has the microphone uh, has the opportunity to speak to all members, so we can hear the questions clearly, and we can also hear the answers clearly. clearly. The honourable uh, member from Dufferin Khaled. The great liberal lies. The budget will balance itself, and the rebate check is larger than the cost of the carbon tax. Everyone knows that is not actually what's happened. And you know who else has joined the carbon tax revolt? Six premiers in this country who are calling for a carbon tax summit. Newfoundland and Labrador, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Ontario, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. Will this out-of-touch Prime Minister actually call this conference the carbon tax summit? Or is he too busy hiding because he called the premiers liars? So, colleagues.
colleagues, I'd like to remind all colleagues on all sides of the House uh, that it's, we must be very careful about using the word uh, lies. Although it wasn't directed at an individual, um, it is really important that we not use language, as you know, that uh, it can be disturbing uh, and can disturb the affairs of the House. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Look, on this side of the House, we actually believe in facts and we believe in science. The Honourable Member makes statements that actually have zero basis in fact. 200 economists in this country signed a letter last to two weeks ago saying that 8 out of 10 Canadians get more money back. The Parliamentary Budget Officer says that 8 out of 10 Canadians get money back. They can make up all the things that they want to, but the facts are on our side. It is an, an, an issue that addresses affordability for Canadians particularly those on modest incomes. It is a plan to address climate change. Those reckless, irresponsible Conservatives on the other side of the House should be ashamed. Again, I'd like to remind members to please stay away from language. That could be, uh, that certainly it's getting close, closer and closer to unparliamentary. The Honourable Member from Chilliwack Hope. After eight years of this NDP Liberal government, many Canadians can no longer afford to feed their families. Last year, two million Canadians visited food banks in a single month alone. But instead of bringing down the cost of food, the Prime Minister increased the carbon tax on groceries by 23 per cent on April 1st. Clearly, this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Instead of making things worse, will the Prime Minister finally cut the cost of food by adopting Conservative Bill C-234 to take all carbon taxes off of farmers in next week's budget. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. The Honourable Government House Leader. It's important that we talk in this House about all of the supports that we're providing to farmers and uh, the agricultural community in the context of our fight against climate change, Mr. Speaker. But I would also point out that after having Conservative Senators threaten female Senators on amendments on this bill, this is a Conservative private member's bill that they can prioritize at any moment and bring to a vote in this House. It's up to them. C-334's fate is decided on the Conservative side of the House, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Chilliwack Hope. Mr. Speaker, this Liberal government is completely out of touch with ordinary Canadians who can't feed their families with phony Liberal photo ops. Canadians are already lining up at the food banks in record numbers, and increasing the carbon tax on farmers and food is only making things worse. Seventy per cent of Canadians want this government to axe the tax, and half a dozen Premiers are demanding an emergency meeting on the carbon tax crisis. So will the Prime Minister stop hiding and hold a carbon tax conference? with the Premiers and listen to their plans to axe the tax. Right. The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources and Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I would implore the Conservatives in opposition to actually use facts when they actually make statements. 200 economists in this country have validated the fact that the carbon price is the most efficient way to reduce emissions and is done in a manner that is affordable. When Premier Mo actually came before the, uh, the committee a couple of weeks ago, journalists actually called the statements that he was making, which are the same as what this fellow is making, a parade of nonsense and completely dishonest. I totally agree. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, haute saint charles Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Liberal Prime Minister, rents have doubled and our youth can no longer dream of buying a first home. Record lines at food banks. Everything this Prime Minister touches just withers. He's breaking everything in Ottawa, and now he wants to bring his incompetence to Quebec with these centralizing pre-budget announcements. Will the Prime Minister finally understand that this is just making things worse for Quebecers? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. Mr. Speaker, on the contrary, we are investing to build housing in Quebec. For example, the Accelerated Housing Fund in Quebec has enabled us to sign an agreement with the province, $1.8 billion, to build 8,000 affordable housing units throughout the province. The Conservatives are against that investment. It's incredible. We will continue to invest to Im improve the situation and build affordable housing more quickly. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker. 
how can we trust this government when we think of the way they manage everything, the border, the armed forces, arrive can, EI, everything this government does goes wrong for eight years, and now they're adding insult to injury by interfering with Quebec jurisdiction. Does this prime minister understand that this will make the situation worse for Quebecers and all Canadians? The Honourable Minister of Public Services, my colleague, the Minister for Housing, spoke about the 8,000 affordable housing units that will be built by Quebec municipalities. We already know that the leader of the opposition had six affordable housing units built when he was Minister of Housing. And what the member may not know is that is in own riding. There is a project that built 163 affordable housing units, which is about 25 times more than his leader managed to build throughout his entire term and throughout the entire country. The Honourable Member for Jonquière. Now, in the expression area of jurisdiction, there's the word jurisdiction. When you have a toothache, you don't call up the barber, and you shouldn't call up the federal government either. Federal dental coverage is still not available, and yet already everyone is mad at Ottawa. Seniors are mad because they were promised free dental care, but instead they're going to have to pay. Dentists are mad because Ottawa is blaming them. And all of this because Ottawa, which knows nothing about the matter, promised free dental care without totting up the bill. Why not instead act like the tooth fairy and slip the money under Quebec's pillow? The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, it is essential that everyone throughout the country and each and every Quebecer can receive dental care. That is our objective, and that is what we will do. In the spirit of cooperation, I will continue to work with the government of Quebec. The Bloc Québécois is always trying to pick arguments and find problems, whereas our government is finding solutions and ensuring that everyone gets the health care they need. The Honourable Member for Jonquière. Mr. Speaker, Ottawa could send money to Quebec's insurance, health insurance program for dental care. Quebec is ready to do that, but Ottawa is instead creating red tape redundancy and is making everyone mad, even though the program hasn't even started yet. With housing, Ottawa could give the money right away, but instead it's going to lead to a constitutional conflict until 2025. The federal government is not like King Midas. Instead of touching things and they turn to gold, it touches things and they turn to mold. Why continue interfering with Quebec jurisdiction? Why would we let them do that when everything takes longer and is ultimately worse? The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, the system for dental coverage is simple. People will receive a card, and with that card, dentists throughout the country can use the same system as they do with any other kind of dental insurance. And then very easily, patients will receive necessary services. If Quebec wishes to manage the system, that's not a problem. We can work together. However, it's absolutely essential that the service be available immediately for Quebecers, and that's what we'll do. The Honourable Member from Battleford's Lloyd Minster. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. After eight years of this, Prime Minister, Canadians are struggling to put food on the table. Food banks received a record two million visits in a single month last year alone, and, million, and a million more Canadians are expected to visit food banks again this year. The carbon tax is driving up the costs of groceries and everything else. Struggling families are desperate for relief in next week's budget. So, Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister axe the carbon tax on farmers so the food prices can go down? The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources and Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, the Honourable Member is, is uh, saying things that are devoid of facts. And in fact, what she is proposing will actually take money away from folks who live on modest incomes. Eight out of ten families get, get more money.
money back than they pay in the price on pollution, and it works directly inverse to income. It's those people that live on most modest incomes that would be most impacted by their plan to cut the carbon rebate. That is reckless, that is irresponsible, and it puts at risk people who live in this country on modest incomes. The chair did not uh, hear the, the comments by the minister, unfortunately. I wasn't paying attention, but there is so important for members to stop, not use language which can be, uh, which can be disturbing to the affairs of the House. The honourable member from Battleford, Lloyd Minster. Actually, Mr. Speaker, Canadians are painfully aware that this Prime Minister and his NDP Liberal government are not worth the cost. Here, here. Last right. week's carbon tax hike is driving up the cost of gas, groceries and home heating. Families are struggling, like I said, to put food on the table and they cannot afford higher costs. Next, week, next week's budget must take the foot off the gas of the rising grocery prices. So once again, Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister axe the tax on farmers and make food more affordable for Canadians? Here, here, here. Absolutely. The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources and Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would suggest to my honourable colleague across the House, who is from the, the great province of Saskatchewan, that she go and have a conversation with Dr. Brent Dolter at the University of Regina, who has said 8 out of 10 Canadian families get more money back, and it's those that actually live on modest incomes that do the best on a net benefit basis. It is an affordability program, but it is also a program to address the climate crisis, which imperils the future of our children. The fact that these folks have zero plan to address the climate issue and they don't seem to care at all about it is reckless and it is irresponsible. I'm sur certain all members would like to listen to the uh, honourable member from uh, North Northumberland Peterborough South ask his question and to receive uh, a question, uh, an answer in response. The honourable member. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, this Prime Minister has a superpower. It's the ability to spend other people's money. But I'd like to remind him that it's not his money he's spending. It's the hard-earned dollars of Canadians. He is clear he has no respect for Canadians or their hard-earned dollars. Mr. Speaker, he's just not worth the cost. Will his government commit to a pay-as-you-go rule in the upcoming budget to help fix the financial disaster they caused? The Honourable President of the Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker, an accurate representation of the facts would be the following. First of all, we have a AAA credit rating. That's by an independent, objective observer of our economy. Second of all, with regards to expenditures, we on this side of the House invest in Canadians, especially in vulnerable Canadians. $10 a day child care, early childhood learning and education, a national school program. Meanwhile, they vote against. They vote against dental care. They vote against pharmacare. Mr. Speaker, every day is a great day to fight for Canadians, and that's exactly what we'll do. The Honourable Member from Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While the Liberals deflect, deny and gaslight, common sense Conservatives will remain laser focused on the affordability crisis. Bill C-234 is back before this House and the Liberals have a chance to help Canadians by reducing food costs, by reducing the burden on farmers, which will ultimately make everything more affordable. Will they finally give farmers a break? Will they finally give Canadians a break by reducing and eliminating the carbon tax on farmers? Here, here. Oh. The Honourable Government House Leader. Bill C-234 is a Conservative private, private member's bill that that party right. can elect to bring to this House for a vote at any time. I would invite the Honourable, I would invite the honourable Member to talk to his House Leadership and we'll get on with the vote for C-234. Here, here. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, rent is expensive, groceries are expensive, everything is expensive. Quebecers are suffering while the CEOs of big grocery stores are gilding their pockets on their backs. Instead of making this lot pay their fair share, the Liberals are giving them a $60 billion gift. Thank you who? Thank you to the Conservatives who gave this money, our money, when they were in power. Money that could be invested in social and affordable housing, in health, or in the fight against climate, of the climate crisis. But no, the Liberals prefer to give it to ri rich CEOs. Why do the Liberals continue to gild the pockets of big business?
The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. Mr. Speaker, my colleague will admit that we do invest for the most vulnerable Canadians throughout the country. We also invest in childcare, we invest in housing, and my colleague knows full well that the best way to stabilize grocery prices is to have more competitivity in our country. And that is exactly what we have done with the biggest competitivity reform in history. Everyone here knows that we want to help Canadians, and that is what we are doing and what we'll continue to do. No, no, the, sorry, the Honourable Member from Winnipeg Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Liberals' child care plan forgets child care workers, 96 per cent whom are women, many facing a burnout crisis. And the recent Liberal announcement falls short of what experts are calling for. Childhood educators need better wages and working conditions to improve retention and recruitment. Meanwhile, the Conservatives are pushing privatized child care that would even hurt workers even more. When will the minister stop with the disrespect and deliver a workforce strategy that allows workers to live in dignity. The Honourable Minister for Families, Children and Social Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague for the question and her continued advocacy on behalf of early learning child care workers. Our government continues to work with the provinces and territories as evidenced most recently with our budget announcement, which includes loan forgiveness for early childhood educators who choose to work in rural and remote communities where we see the need for more educators and more childcare spaces. We'll continue to work on the workforce strategies with the provinces and territories to support this workforce. The Honourable Member from St. John's East. Mr. Speaker, tourism is one of the most important pillars of Atlantic Canada's economy. In my riding of St. John's East, the Belle Island Heritage Society, number two mine tour and community museum, is a hidden gem. Recognized as a world-class destination, they are helping attract tourists to experience for themselves what our community has to offer. This, in turn, supports our local economy. Can the Minister for Court tell us what efforts are being made to help our booming tourism sector grow even more, specifically in Atlantic Canada? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Big things are happening on the East Coast. In February, I was with the Minister of Tourism to announce the signing of the Atlantic Canada Agreement on Tourism. This $30 million agreement gives a major boost to more than 7,500 tourism businesses throughout Atlantic Canada. This support creates year-round opportunities, fuels innovative marketing, grows our Indigenous product, and brings more visitors to our beautiful corner of the world. With their breathtaking landscapes, delectable cuisine, and renowned hospitality, our region region has so much to offer, and we're pulling out all the stops. You put Atlantic Canada on your bucket list this year. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, after eight years, this Prime Minister is simply not worth the cost. $500 billion later and without controlling spending, this is the result. The cost of rent has doubled. One child in four in Canada does not have enough to eat, and two million Canadians have to go to food banks. That is the Liberal record after eight years of this Prime Minister's mismanagement. And because the Prime Minister has invaded provincial jurisdictions, Quebecers' lives have become worse. The same for Canadians' lives. Will the Prime Minister withdraw from provincial jurisdictions and stop making life worse for Quebecers and Canadians? The Honourable Minister for Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My colleague is right to speak about the cost of living. The cost of living is important for middle-class families and lower-class families. What is interesting is that they are against childcare benefits that reduce child poverty by 50% every month. They are against dental care for children and now for seniors. They are against investments in childcare services that in Quebec have shown us how important it is for gender equality. And now they seem to be against investments in housing, despite the fact that their Conservative leader didn't do much for housing when he was a housing minister. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to mention to the Minister that most things that he mentioned we voted for. However, what makes us angry and what makes Canadians angry is that this government has absolutely no efficiency when it comes to taking care of its own business. Passports, 
the armed forces, the border, immigration, the cost of living, and the cost of living. The list is long, Mr. Speaker. That is government in action. And what's this government doing right now? It's, it's uh, butting into provincial jurisdictions. It's not their business. So they can't even handle their own business, but they try to get into provincial businesses. When will the government finally step up and respect its own jurisdictions rather than butting into provincial jurisdictions? The Honourable Minister for Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I would like to remind my honourable colleague that in his writing, there are about 12,000 families who every month, on the 20th of every month, get the Canada Child Care Benefit. That's about $500 every month, non-taxable for these families, which reduces poverty by 50% in his writing. Unfortunately, one of the first things that the Conservatives did in 2016 was to vote against this child care benefit that is beneficial to millions of families and children in his riding in, in Canada. The Honourable Member from Miganti Clérable. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. After eight years, this Prime Minister is simply not worth the cost of his own incompetence. His inflationary pol policies have increased the cost of everything. Rent has doubled. Inflation has reached record levels. Violent crimes make our streets less and less safe. Quebecers have less and less purchasing power after having almost shattered in Ottawa. Now, the Prime Minister has passed the last two weeks announcing that he now wants to shatter various provinces, including Quebec. Can the Prime Minister simply just mind his own business for once? The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, what we hear is the party of inaction speak to us. If we were to listen to the Conservatives, Mr. Speaker, to do nothing is to solve all the problems. No, Mr. Speaker, the people watching us at home know that we have to invest in housing, that we have to invest in childcare, that we have to invest in a green future. And if you want to talk about success, let us just look at the biggest private investment in Quebec in history. We managed to attract the biggest investment in Quebec in history. We believe that to invest is to succeed, not only today, but in the future as well. The Honourable Member from Miganti Clérable. Like the Minister has often said, people at home knows that after eight years, the Prime Minister is the only one responsible for his own incompetence, his own field of incompetence. It's not for nothing that Quebec doesn't want him to have him around anymore. He wanted to interfere in housing, and Quebecers have seen the price of their rent double. He wanted to interfere in the lives of the middle class, and he's shattered young people's dream of becoming homeowners one day. And now workers, middle-class workers, have to turn to food banks. When the Prime Minister interferes, Quebec has foot the staggering bill. Will the Prime Minister finally listen to common sense and put aside his plans to meddle further in areas where he has clearly shown he has absolutely no skill or competence? The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I don't think that when it comes to competency and skill, we have any lessons to learn for the Conservatives. Every time we have been here for Canadians, the Conservatives have always voted against. They're against childcare. They're against investments in housing. They're against investments for seniors. Mr. Speaker, if we were to listen to the Conservatives, we would say no to everything. But no, in today's real world, those who are doing well are investing in our country. We're investing in healthcare, in education, and in housing, Mr. Speaker. Those who are confident will invest in their population. That's what we do, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Longueuil Saint Hubert. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are many tangible measures we can take to tackle the housing crisis. I proposed 12 of them this very morning, and I'm ready to discuss them with the Liberals at any time. They have my number. Because their only measure right now is to impose ill-conceived conditions upon the provinces, otherwise Ottawa will cut off the funds. The Prime Minister is bluntly telling the provinces that refuses blackmail. You want us to respect your areas of jurisdiction? Then do without federal money. Mr. Speaker, it's our money. In short, no concrete measures, just threats to the provinces and municipalities. So is this the Liberals' plan? It sounds like a Conservative plan. The Honourable Minister for Development, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to hear the question from my colleague because I read the report that he's mentioned and he worked upon that report. In the report, he put forth a number of uh, stakeholders and these stakeholders have spoken positively of housing rights, interveners that have 
commended the fact that we want to build more houses. Here, we're not going to just write reports, we're going to build houses. The Honourable Member for Longueuil, Saint-Hubert. Mr. Speaker, Ottawa's conditions aren't speeding up housing construction, they're slowing them down. Instead of paying the money now so that Quebec can actually go to work, the Liberals are bickering until 2025. The money they're holding back is for infrastructure like waterworks and waterways. That's the first step. Unless the Liberals want, perhaps, housing without drinking water on a wasteland. Imagine, we're just at the stage of putting in running water. We're not even talking about building buildings yet. And already the federal government is hampering everything, slowing everyone down. So why not just pay the money now and tackle the housing crisis right now? The Honourable Minister, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The whole light blue, dark blue rhetoric over on the other side, it's all the same. We can't, on the one hand, say that we want to help people and then vote against, or say that you're going to vote against measures that we have announced this week. The one that he has just mentioned is in last week's announcements. We have announced a fund to help house builders, a fund to defend renter rights. We've announced a fund to make sure that we will have an industrial catalogue to build more rapidly. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we're not just writing reports, we're building houses. The Honourable Member for Belchasse les Etumins Lévis. Mr. Speaker, under the Liberals, one child in four goes hungry after eight years. The cost of housing has doubled. People are sleeping in tents, and the use of food banks has now become the norm. The Prime Minister is failing in his own responsibilities and his inflationary spending is creating chaos. And he has the sheer nerve to lecture the provinces by invading their areas of jurisdiction with his incompetency. Will the Prime Minister listen to the Premier of Quebec who is urging him to withdraw from our area of jurisdiction and simply mind his own business for once? The Honourable Minister for Public Services and uh, Procurement. Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, we're happy to do so with the collaboration of the municipalities of Quebec, including Lévis and the government of Quebec. 8,000 affordable housing units over the next few months. That is the highest level of affordable housing units built by a government for Quebec since the beginning of Quebec's inception. That is why we're working hand in hand with the government of Quebec. They're talking about uh, fields of jurisdiction and competencies, but the least competent is the leader of the Conservatives, who in his time built six entire housing units. Member from St. Albert, Edmonton, excuse me, St. St. Albert, Edmonton. Edmonton. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, yesterday at the public inquiry, it was confirmed that CSIS briefed top Liberal officials that Beijing interfered in the nomination on behalf of the member for Don Valley North. Today, the Globe and Mail is reporting that a top Liberal broke the law by leaking classified information that resulted in the member for Don Valley North being tipped off that he was being monitored by CSIS. So who broke the law? What is the name of that top Liberal? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Safety. Speaker, thank you. I thank the member for the question in regards to the fact that, unfortunately, foreign interference is a problem that some foreign state actors have taken to try to undermine our democracy. But, Mr. Speaker, it's not new, and that's precisely why we have taken this matter so seriously. It's precisely why we have initiated a number of steps to strengthen our democracy. And, Mr. Speaker, we've all all agree to the inquiry and we want to allow that work to continue so Canadians have a full picture of the issues around foreign interference. The Honourable Member from St. Albert Edmonton. Mr. Speaker, that non-answer is completely unacceptable. Enough of the cover-up. Only a handful of Liberal officials were briefed by CSIS. We now know that a top Liberal broke the law undermined the work of CSIS and put the partisan interests of the Liberal Party ahead of national security. So, when did the Prime Minister first learn of this criminal leak and did he refer it to the RCMP? Mr. Speaker, all parties in this House agreed to the terms of reference for Justice Hogue's inquiry. Mr. Speaker, it's important for Canadians and all 
members of this House that foreign interference is not partisan. It's important that we allow Justice Hogue to continue in this work so that Canadians can have a full picture surrounding any attempts of foreign interference in this country. Mr. Speaker, an interim report will be delivered in May, and I look forward to the recommendations on how we can strengthen our democracy. The Honourable Member from Yukon. Speaker, our government signed bilateral agreements with all 13 provinces and territories this past March. A few weeks ago, in my writing, three agreements were announced with the territorial governments to invest a total amount of nearly $86 million to improve health care, access and services for the Yukon. Can you elaborate on what this health investment means for those living in the Yukon and for all Canadians to the Minister of Health? Thank you. I'm certain that the Honourable Member from Yukon wasn't asking the Speaker to elaborate, but indeed the Minister of Health to elaborate. The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker would also be uh, very enthusiastic about the bilateral agreements that have been signed across this country. And I want to thank the member for Yukon, not only for his extraordinary work as a member of parliament, but as a physician and a chief medical officer, uh, the work that he's done to promote public health and better health for Canadians across the country really has to be commended. And I was so proud to be with him in, in, uh, in the Yukon to make an announcement that's going to see more doctors, more nurses, reduce backlog, improve access to care, make sure that we uh, allow our seniors to age at home. It's part of a $200 billion plan to take action across the country. The Honourable Member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. After eight years of this NDP Liberal Prime Minister, we know that he's not worth the cost or the corruption, and we've seen that with the $60 million that he spent on his failed Arrive scam. Last year alone, he spent $21 billion on outside consultants, and his favourite hand-picked consultants' GC strategies are being hauled before the bar of this House to answer questions under threat of imprisonment for lying to Parliament in the inquiries about this Liberal scandal. It's a historic tool for historic levels of corruption. So in the budget next week, will the Prime Minister cut the corruption in his government? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, as we have said time and time again, when it comes to the procurement process, Canadians and all parliamentarians expect the process to be followed, expect laws to be followed. And Mr. Speaker, this is precisely why we have supported the work of the committee. CBSA has already initiated a number of measures to improve the procurement process. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to make those improvements so Canadians have trust in our procurement system. The Honourable Member from Thou sorry, Leeds Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. The procurement system that they're presiding over is so broken that millions of dollars are being paid to firms who add no value and do no work to contracts. Just last year, $21 billion on outside contracts, and this NDP Liberal government isn't worth the cost or the corruption of their $60 million arrive scam that saw GC Strategies paid $20 million but did no work and added no value. For their failed arrive scam, Canadians got lies, fraud and forgery, will they cut the corruption in their budget next Wednesday? Yeah. Yeah. I ask all members please to not take the floor while another member is speaking. That's recognized by the Speaker. In particular, I might ask a member from, I believe it is from Timmins James Bay, to please make sure that his comments uh, are only done when he has the microphone, or when he has the floor. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, it's ironic coming from Conservatives that these very same companies that were also awarded contracts under Conservative leadership for millions of dollars, that Conservatives did nothing to fix the procurement process. But Mr. Speaker, rest assured, Canadians can know that our government takes this exceptionally seriously. It's precisely why we've already implemented changes, something that Conservatives ignored for years. We are not going to do that. We are going to build trust in the procurement system, something Conservatives have failed. 
The Honourable Member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, this House will make history when one of the favourite contractors of this NDP Liberal government is hauled before the bar. The Parliamentary Secretary just said that GC Strategies got contracts from Conservatives. Actually, Speaker, you know when GC Strategies was founded? In 2015. Oh, wow. why this company got so much work after being founded in the same year that they took government, and will this government finally cancel their costly criminal corruption? The Honourable Government House Leader. The member across uh, knows not to use such language, and he knows that there's no evidence for the kind of language that he's using that supports that. The, the government, as well as opposition parties, all voted to bring this gentleman before the bar of the House of Commons, expecting answers. Parliamentarians are entitled to answers. We voted to get the answers, just like they did, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Pretty straight. The Honourable Member from Winnipeg South Centre. Mr. Speaker, our government has been unwavering in its support for our ally Ukraine. With the values of all democracies threatened by Russia's illegal invasion, we have been there every step of the way, doing our part to ensure Ukrainian victory. My riding of Winnipeg South Centre is home to thousands of Canadians of Ukrainian descent, and in recent months we have welcomed thousands more fleeing the war back home. Earlier this year, this House passed the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement. Unfortunately, Conservative opposition prevented this Parliament from signalling unanimous support. There is good news, however, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister of International Trade inform this House of important developments related to this critical and... The Honourable Minister for International Trade. Parliament have passed the Canada-Ukraine free trade. Yeah, yeah. Oh, despite conservative opposition, oh. despite their opposition, Ukraine's Parliament unanimously passed this agreement and have called this agreement one of the most modern, high standard agreements in the world. I'm looking forward to putting this Canada-Ukraine free trade agreement in use because I'm going to take a business delegation to Ukraine so we can work on their rebuilding. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well done. I know it's Wednesday and people are all excited. Let's have the last couple of questions. The Honourable Member from Courtney, Alberta. Mr. Speaker, First Nations in B.C. have suffered enormous loss through their 200-year history of colonization, including the devastating loss of language and culture. Although nations continue to make tremendous progress revitalizing their languages, the Liberals' new formula on funding means a 60 per cent cut to language programs in B.C. Okay. Preserving and revitalizing Indigenous languages is an essential step to reconciliation Will this re government remember its most important relationship with First Nations and act with urgency to ensure sustained and long-term funding to language programs in British Columbia? The Honourable, uh, the Honourable Minister for Indigenous Services. Well, Mr. Speaker, let me just first say that I fully agree with the member opposite about the need to uh, preserve Indigenous languages and restore them when they've been so cruelly ripped away from First Nations communities for decades. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, in my own riding, Matawa uh, Tribal Council uh, provides First Nation language training and support for First Nations communities all through Northern Ontario, supported by this federal government. I'm very proud of the work they're doing and we will continue to work on this uh, preservation with First Nations across the country. The Honourable Member from Spadina, Fort York. The government's defence policy, Our North Strong and Free, is the latest in Liberal smoke and mirrors. It rightfully abbreviates into NSF, which Canadians know means non-sufficient funds. Spread out 20 years, it has insufficient funds, and by insufficient, I mean zero dollars this year. There's nothing for tactical helicopters, maritime sensors, and military housing. Mr. Speaker, with CAF members using food stamps and sleeping in tents, Liberals provided nothing for housing in 2024 and 2025. Is the Prime Minister aware that his facade policy will keep CAF personnel and their families in tents for years? 
the Honourable Minister for National Defence. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and, and perhaps I should send a copy of our, our new policy update for defence to the member opposite, because it's quite clear he hasn't read it. But what I can tell this House, Mr. Speaker, is this a, is a historic investment in new capabilities, in maintaining the equipment, in ensuring that we can not only support the members of the Canadian Armed Forces, but also grow our numbers. There is money for housing. There is money for other supports. And, Mr. Speaker, there is a, a new focus for the Canadian Armed Forces in the defence of Canada that will make us strong at home to help us be strong around the world. And that ends question period, I understand. I believe there is a point of order. I recognize the member for Belleuil Chambly. Mr. Speaker, there has been consultations amongst